we have another minute to wait and we'll start right at 1.30, I guess. Can you tell how many people are logged on? Or we now have 17 people that are in. Okay. Yeah, including us, so 13 attendees. That's true. Oh, okay. You've got one person that's calling in. I think that was Fred Marshall, because he sent oh, me an email. So how will that show up? He'll just be able to hear. Yeah, so, um, so for the person calling in, I believe if you do need to unmute your phone, it's gonna be star six, and then you're gonna be able to unmute it um, at, later on if, if that's necessary. Okay. How's the background noise, Susie? It's pretty good. I can't hear much from anybody. Okay, good. The last one I was on, my particular connection, I, I had a mute most of the time because it was causing uh, static or something. But if it's not now, I'll just leave. Well, should we give a couple minutes or just get going? What do we want to do? So you've got 16 that have just logged in and one, oh, ooh, somebody was trying out the raise hand option, but they quickly lowered it again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay. Well, I guess we might as well get going. So hi everybody, um, my name is Suzanne Vincent. I'm the coordinator with the Christina Lake Stewardship Society. Um, thanks everybody for taking the time to attend the first of our winter webinar series. This one is focusing on forestry. Uh, so normally in the fall, CLSS hosts the Watershed Management Plan Annual Review. Um, it's usually a day long meeting where we hear year-end summaries and updates from various levels of government and industry, First Nations and other organizations on their environmental programs and projects and activities that are happening in our area and in our watershed. Um, because of the obvious, we were unable to hold that meeting this year. Um, so we've decided to try something different and, and I guess it's not different for everybody because everybody's doing it these days, but um, we wanted to share some information via a webinar. So this is a first for us and we hope it's going to achieve the same results as the watershed annual review where you guys can learn about, about our local environment and engage with some of the presenters. Um, so I just wanna make one introduction right now and that's Christine Anderson who's in the background. She's the watershed planner with the, the regional district and she's gonna be helping with the technical side of things uh, which I greatly appreciate. She's kind of become an old hand at this. <laughs> So thank you very much for that. And she'll also be helping to monitor the chat and the Q&A um, part of things. Um, so we'll start off with a bit of housekeeping items. Uh, the webinar is gonna be recorded. Um, so we're being recorded right now. It's gonna be available on the CLSS website and I'll be sending out a follow-up email just so that you guys will have the location of that. During the presentations, the attendees will be muted um, you can unmute upon request. So I'm not, is there a, I guess when you hit your mute button um, down in the left-hand side, you can request down there. Is that right, Christina? Actually, what we'll probably have is people to raise their hand if they're looking to be unmuted. And then what I, we will do is we will um, allow them to talk. It's sort of, that's the terminology here on the webinar. Uh, and then they will then accept that and unmute themselves at that point. And how do you raise your hand? I thought it was under the chat. So it's, it, it should be in participant under the participant. Okay. I've actually got somebody that's raised their hand a couple of times, but I think if you can, it's harder as the... Um, yeah, I don't see it on mine, but... You go down to the bottom right where it says more and it'll ah. give you... Okay. So um, where was I at there? So if, 
aside from um, the, what am I, where am I going here? <laughs> so during the presentations, it'll be muted. At the end of the presentations, there's gonna be room for some questions. And also we have some time at the end of the whole session. So if there's any discussion that comes up there, we should be able to talk about it then. If at some point somebody wants to type in a chat uh, in the uh, question and answer box, a question that we feel needs to be answered right away for clarity, then either Christina and I will type up and kind of bring that forward. So we mentioned this earlier, if you're on the phone line and you wish to speak, you need to press star six and it doesn't work with all phones. So um, there's a chance it may not work, but it's worth a shot. <laughs> and otherwise, um, I think if there's still just the one caller, I did give them the email address if they did have a question. Um, and everybody else who's on the Zoom video, you can notice the chat box and the question and answers at the bottom. Um, so we talked about that earlier. The chat, if you have any technical issues, type that in, um, into there. And Christina is going to be monitoring that. And then the question and answer for questions. So we'll also be checking that out. And we were going to do a short um, poll at the start of this one, just to get an idea where everybody's at. And, um, and then we'll start with the presentations. So you should be able, you'll see a pop up and you should be able to answer this. And then if we hit submit, the answers are pretty real time, which is kind of neat. Yeah, we've got four people, five, six, seven people that have answered already. So 54% of people that have responded. So we're just waiting for results. Yeah, or is there another one? Is there an end poll? Are we ready? Are we, are we done? Was, was, there, was that the last one? I wasn't sure if we added the second one. Yeah, we did add, we did add. So there's your results right there for the first one. And uh, so 82% in the boundary, that's great. Okay, and then I'm gonna share that. And then the next one. Your second poll. Okay. Good. Okay. Oh, hi, I see, um, Micah, you have a comment there. The polls are, they kind of pop up and close as, as we put them out there. Um, but it's okay if you, if you missed that part, we're going to continue on with the presentations. So first up, I'll just quick a quick rundown, we're gonna hear from Scott with the Forestry 101 um, presentation, then Forest Health in the Boundary with Marnie, um, BC Timber Sales <laughs> updates with Scott again, and Interpro updates with Evan and Doug. So Scott Leslie is the Woodland Supervisor for BC Timber Sales in Grand Forks. And you're gonna start us off by speaking about forestry planning and giving us the 101. Yeah, thanks Suzanne. Thank you. Oh, here's some feedback. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to run through a kind of a, a quick overview, more so um, yeah, the Forestry 101 type thing is is related to uh, BC timber sales. And um, hopefully I still have that open. And uh, from that, there's just a separate document I wanted to look at, which kind of goes over the um, what I call the life cycle of, of a timber sale license. And um, let's see if this can work. I tried it out and it worked before. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so basically what I'm gonna go over is, is some of the, the guidance provincial, mainly provincial legislation that guides uh, BC timber sales 
um, under the umbrella of a, of a larger ministry. Um, this PowerPoint may not be 100% accurate on the name of the ministry with the changes and additions of, of different people and different names and a little reorganization there. So uh, pardon on that one, but this is kind of a general overview of, um, this is a document here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at separately, um, which is, is basically gonna take the, the, the way that the wood, the way that BCTS markets um, the wood provincially um, and specifically here, we'll just go over some of the flow from the bits and pieces, parts of the, uh, when timber sale license is active out there or somebody sees something going on. I don't know if anyone, everyone can still hear me. Um, so generally I'm gonna just go through uh, a couple things of guidance that, that um, if you have any questions again, um, or follow up or something like that, let me know. Um, a lot of this is available out on the internet, um, out on the different websites. There may be uh, some or all of you that are familiar with some of it from digging around over the years um, and possibly just dealing with timber sales in different ways and capacities that you might be aware of already. So um, what it is, is, is the forestry legislation in BC kind of guides the, 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 the operations that we conduct, um, both regulation and um, the direction that uh, we are set up to meet uh, either provincial goals, um, local and annual and kind of quarterly goals for um, achieving those provincial mandate. So you can see in there that there are different uh, bits and pieces of Is he frozen or is it just my it computer? Is. Yeah, okay. no, I, so I think Scott's frozen there. Uh, maybe, maybe if you, Scott, if you turn your video off, would that help? Probably. And we'll wait a few more minutes. Usually the legislation of the Forest Act. Uh, so just so you know, Scott, you were frozen for a bit there. So we've missed a bit of what you were saying. Oh, did he is straight down? Am I back? You're you back. <laughs> back. Sorry about that. So, is there so we did we did miss quite a bit of it, and we're wondering if you turned your video off, if it would help things. Yeah, for sure. Okay. okay, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically what I want to set up was there's a legislative framework that guides timber sales in um, what what we base our operations off are uh, ultimately our, our goals across the range of the Forest Range and Practices Act and the legislation to guide the uh, tenure development that we use. Um, FERP is mainly responsible for the values that we uh, account for in the in the in the forest stewardship plans. So the Forest Act just oversimplified in a, a few key functions that has to deal with the tenures on uh, how they're how they're issued um, and some of the conditions, um, some of the ways the administration happens uh, with how they're set up the uh, deposit administration and that stuff works um, in the Forest Act.
as well as uh, what would be the contentious timber supply review. I wonder if there's value in us trying to get Scott to phone. Yeah. Just for audio. Are you sending him a message, a chat? Uh, Do we want to go? Was he, were you able to chat with him? No? We need some on hold music. <laughs> <laughs> move on to Marnie and then hopefully Scott will get back to us <laughs> at some point. Is that okay, Marnie? Yeah, I'm, I'm good to go here. I will uh, share my screen. Okay. How's that? That looks good. Okay. I guess I can move this one over. So I will talk briefly about uh, force health in Boundary. I'm a regional entomologist, and I've also got um, some information from Michael Murray. He's our regional pathologist to, uh, to present. And so we'll just get into it. So as an overview, um, forest health encompasses um, the protection and management of BC forests for uh, the impacts for a wide range of forest health factors. We focus a lot on bark beetles. We also have periodic uh, outbreaks of defoliators, so things that chew on the needles or the leaves of trees, uh, pathogens, so our diseases, animal damage, abiotic factors. So we've had a lot of drought issues in Boundary. We've had wildfire and we've had blowdown, which would be considered abiotic. So I'll break it down into bark beetles, looking both at mountain pine beetle and Douglas fir beetle. The defoliators of concern would be western spruce budworm, Douglas fir tussock moth, and we had a little blip in gypsy moth. So I will give you an update on that. And then as far as Michael Murray's pathogens, uh, of biggest concern is our malaria. So mountain pine beetle over the last decade. In uh, 2014 is when uh, mountain pine beetle really spiked in the boundary. And uh, at that time, oh, actually I think it was in 2016 where the majority of mountain pine beetle in the province because it had crashed a lot of other places uh, was still rampant in boundary. Since that time, 2017 and onward, we have seen a substantial decrease in mountain pine beetle. And we only recorded 150 hectares of attack this last year from our aerial overview surveys. So very low amounts. As we are seeing more drought conditions, mountain pine beetle is going into trees of smaller diameter. And so we are not out of the woods in terms of mountain pine beetle pressures. Uh, we are still going to be actively um, serving and monitoring for mountain pine beetle and we might see a resurgence as they are going into those smaller stress trees. Douglas fir beetle has done the reverse. So Douglas fir beetle 
had fairly insignificant values up until 2014. And since that time, we've seen a fairly steady increase. So in the last two years in particular, we have seen numbers over 1,000 hectares just for boundary and over 1,600 hectares recorded in 2020. So Douglas fir beetle, unlike mountain pine beetle, it focuses on trees that are stressed, um, trees that are down. So some wind, flow, uh, wind events has increased the, the Douglas fir beetle and also the, the drought stress like I indicated for mountain pine beetle. So preferentially attack stressed or downed trees. So the top picture there is showing a, a typical example of blowdown. And, and I know that we've had some significant blowdown events in Boundary. And so you usually see a, res, a, a resurgence of uh, um, the beetle increasing within a year or two after those events. So uh, Fred Marshall's on the line there. He can account for his particular woodlot was kind of in the cyclone of, of the 2018 June event that created extensive wind, wind throw. And since that time, we have seen a, a jump in Douglas fir beetle. Droughts 2015, 17, and 18 are also causing stress in the trees. And as a result of that, our numbers are increasing. And so this just map shows the, the entire uh, boundary area. If we focus on the green dots, the green dots represent where we've mapped Douglas fir beetle in 2020. The red, there's just a little bit in the top. Do, do you see my cursor moving around as well? Yeah, yeah okay. So we've got a, a little concentration of, of mountain pine beetle, and these could represent anywhere from one to, to 50 tree. And then the other dots here with the green are the, where the uh, Douglas fir beetle is, which is fairly spread out throughout the whole boundary TSA. And then focusing in on the area that's specific around Christina Lake, you can see that there's very active populations of Douglas fir beetle. So in terms of management, as a proactive long-term management strategy, and this is where we would like to get to, we're looking at high hazard host removal. So what that means is we are going to take out those large diameter stressed Douglas fir trees or blow down before we get population increases. If the beetles have not got there in, in any large numbers and we are able to remove that host, we can get ahead of the game. So both mountain pine beetle and Douglas fir beetle are, are part of our natural ecosystem. They're basically everywhere where we're going to find their host types, whether that's pine or fir, and they are released on certain events. So the reactive management is once the beetles are in the stand, our best tool is sanitation harvest. And that is taking out the trees that actively have current beetle populations in them with making note that we've got low stumps. So we've got as, as uh, low amount of um, that host left on the landscape trying not to have any mechanical damage when we're doing that sanitation harvest, and then also dealing post-harvest with the debris, whether that's debris within the block, the slash piles, they're, they're burnt in, in, a, in a window of time um, within a year or so after harvest. The other tools that we have are trap trees. So that is just basically taking a tree and dropping it on the ground that had no beetles in it previously. And like I said, the beetles are attracted to down trees. So we can, we can trick them. We can put them into trees that we could easily remove. We also have funnel trapping, which looks at uh, uh, concentrating beetles in those traps. We can use an anti-aggregation pheromone, MCH, and push them away from certain areas, keep them out of um, areas that we can't actively manage. And in some cases, we do pursue single tree treatment, things like fall and burn. So uh, for those areas that are, are harder to address with the harvesting, if they're scattered on the landscape, uh, we can focus our efforts with the single tree treatments. And then post logging mop up. So this last year in combination with uh, 15 woodlot licensees in the, in the boundary, 
I was able to carry out a Douglas Furby light lure study. So I, like I said, these funnel traps shown in the picture here are really effective at concentrating beetles. The concern is that we need quite a large opening. So it's a 100 meter minimum radius opening. And that is for um, trees that are within that 100 meter radius have a great potential of spillover attack. So what I was looking at was testing some other compounds that weren't quite as attractive, but they had a, a less um, of a radius for spillover. So this was done April through August, and uh, I'm, I'm just finishing the analysis now, so it should be out fairly quickly. And uh, then hopefully we can have a tool that we can use for maybe a 50 meter radius opening instead. Operational work, uh, we do the aerial overview surveys every year. It's an annual basis. And uh, we start this usually July and August. We usually have amazing coverage in the boundary, Kootenai boundary area. And so for, uh, I think the last 10 years, we've had close to 100% coverage. Our target provincially is 85% coverage. And there's some areas in the, in the North that they are struggling with on, a, on an annual basis. To monitor populations, we do uh, three tree beating, and we're looking for the larvae of Western spruce budroom, Douglas fir tussock moth, and Western hemlock looper. And then also for monitoring populations, we do egg mass sampling and boundary. On an annual basis, we put out about 5,000 traps throughout the province to monitor for gypsy moth, which is an invasive. And it, particularly in, the, uh, in our region, we've got 72 traps. So luckily our, our numbers have been low for Western Spruce Budroom and Douglas for Tussock Moth. Um, the numbers coming back yielding for 2020. And like I said, on an annual basis, we are looking at all life stages to, uh, to, to see what's happening. Our Gypsy Moth um, is an invasive species. So it's one of, the, one of the 100 most destructive invasive species worldwide. It has established itself into Eastern Canada and the U United States. Uh, this happened in about 1860 uh, when it was introduced from Europe. And it is, it, it, it loves all shrubs, um, trees, host plants. It really goes for the deciduous species. It is our number one priority for controlling in BC because of the implications with um, trade and uh, export. And so we're looking for complete eradication. So in 2020 was our first spray in the interior and that happened in Castlegar. So quite close to the Christina Lake area. We also had a spray program in, in Surrey, Surrey and Lake Cowichan. So what happened was we, uh, we started off and we trapped three moths in Pass Creek. Uh, the next year we were up to 13 moths in five traps. And then in the fall, we were trying to find these egg masses, which is almost impossible to find. So uh, we weren't able to. We did the open house and then we had three sprays that happened this spring in two in May and one in June. And we had excellent coverage. When we went back and we did our trapping, we actually only found one single moth outside of the spray area. And a single moth doesn't warrant a spray. So it looks like we will be out of the water for next year that uh, we've, we've got whatever little population was brewing around Castlegar. So this is what the spray area looked like as well as the positive identification with those traps. So we've got a buffer around it to make sure that we get anything outside of that zone. So it was 167 hectares. And uh, yeah, I mean, we started spraying at five in the morning. I don't know if some people might have um, um, heard about the spray program, but uh, it was over residents and uh, it can be quite alarming to people to have this low flying aircraft uh, spraying. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about was our malaria and it has been a significant concern in boundary, um, especially in the moister uh, back units. And my counterpart, the uh, regional pathologist, Michael Murray, he has got several field trials. So one is in Zibbins Woodlot, and he's looking at uh, dumping treatments and the efficacy that, that they're having. 
he did all of the measurements this this last fall and again is is starting to do the analysis he also has another stumping trial that's up around granby river so these things are, are long-term trials um, and uh, he'll be able to provide more information if you've got questions So that's it. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Uh, I know that's super interesting for me as I've heard a little bit about this information coming forward. We did have one question from Jeff Olson. What do you attribute the rapid drop in pine beetle to? Uh, part of it is host supply. And so those large numbers that uh, increased and then we, we had a, a reduction. Uh, we did have a lot of the older age class pine that was taken out by that big infestation. Um, we also had really smoky, this is speculation, but a lot of people have pinpoint, they have been talking about this. So our huge fires that we had in 17 and 18 and the smoky conditions at the time of fight for Mount Pine Beetle might have made it harder for them to find their host trees. It seems very coincidental that that's when populations really started to crash. So it's probably a combination of host availability and just being able to find their host effectively. I, I would like to add, I, there have been thousands of hectares of pine logged over the last 20 years as well. Yeah, so the host removal there. I was wondering, um, do you see any decrease just from, say this year we had a bit of cooler temperature earlier in the year, uh, earlier towards the summer, kind of in June and July, would that affect them at all? Or is that with the fur bark beetle? Yeah, or so we, what we saw with our trapping program with the fur, because we had a very cool wet spring. And so, um, they start to fly at about 16 degrees. And because temperatures didn't reach that in, in April, like we can we um, can see flights starting as early as April 1st. And our traps really didn't catch much until into May. So it seemed like everything was switched probably by about four to six weeks. And then we had an extended flight that went right into the end of September, which usually we don't have much of a flight beyond July. So it was potentially skewed to later on in the season because of those cool wet temperatures. Okay. Yeah. I see, Christina, there's a comment here. Um, you know where the stumping trial up the Granby is located? And I can't see, that's Margaret Steele that asked that. I, I don't have those details, but I could get them or someone could contact Michael directly. I believe they're up uh, uh, bunch grass, near bunch grass. Great, thanks, Doug. Does anybody on any of the buddy on the line have any more questions? I don't know. There's not much that came into the Q and A, and I don't know if. Um, we should move on or if we want to give it a sec. Yeah, I think we've got Scott on the phone as well. And if anybody wants to raise their hand, um, I can also work to unmute you. Yeah, this is Scott on the phone. Can you hear me? Scott, that's great. We can hear you. So this is perfect. I've okay. just got one person raising their hand. So I'm just going to. So hopefully, Jeff, you will see the the request to speak. Can you hear me? I can. <clears throat> That's not a picture of me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so with all these sort of new things going on, how what, what is sort of the level of concern um, cumulatively with all these things to the forests and, and I guess indirectly to the forestry industry? Is this just something we're going to manage or is this something that is going to back when the pine beetle came it was catastrophic sort of so just wondering in that respect yeah in terms of the forest health issues the the defoliators tend to cycle so we've had 
our expectation is that we will see a rise in, in uh, Western spruce budworm, potentially Douglas fir tussock moth, and that's on a, a cyclic basic, cyclic basis. Um, so it, uh, we're maybe a, a year or two lag to what we anticipated. Those numbers may increase. We are seeing significant amount of Douglas fir beetle that we haven't seen in the past. And so, yeah, it is, a, it is a major concern in terms of losses in our forest industry. At what point do you see, um, I guess at what point during a drought do you really see it start to impact or do you really see the beetles starting to impact the trees? Do they have a kind of a couple years of drought before they get hammered or? Yeah, and it's kind of like uh, having reserves that, you know, if, you, if you're sick and um, you don't have a lot of energy, then you can, you can rebound after one thing, but after successive years of drought, it's compounded, that information. So, um, yeah, when we saw back-to-back -back drought condition in 17 and, and 18, then we usually have about a year lag time and then significant e increases in bark beetles, specifically Douglas fir beetle, sometimes spruce beetle, but we're not seeing much for spruce beetle in boundary. When you see, say you had a beetle that was, or a, an area that was pretty hard hit with beetle, if you had um, a fire go through there, would you see, does that do a pretty good job of cleaning out the beetle as well, the forest fire, or, or would it kind of push the beetles further out? So there's, there's such variability in a forest fire. And so when we see black and, and charred and, uh, and those trees are outright dead, then that obviously kills the beetles. But what happens is when you have this mosaic across the landscape of that forest fire, and if you have lightly charring or you still have green needles, so maybe you have some root damage, but you don't have outright mortality of those trees, it, they're just more attractive to beetles the next year. So instead of reducing beetle populations, we're actually increasing it because we've got more host material. And so when we're doing sanitation or sorry, salvage harvest for forest fires, often they'll take the black charred wood first, um, but that, that green wood, um, we're, we're kind of setting it up for beetle attack the following year, depending on what the local pressures are. We've got one more person that's just raised their hand to speak. Do, do we have time for that? Susie? We... Okay, I, I, oops. Yeah, I was muted there, but I think, I think we probably do. Perfect. So Daryl, I've just unmuted you, hopefully. You did, can you hear me? Sure. Yep. Okay, I, uh... A quick question on the logging uh, that's been happening on the west side of Christina Lake, around the bottom middle section of the lake. Does that have a, a positive or negative effect on, uh, on the local forestry health? That's probably something that um, Scott can speak to. Yeah, I'm not sure on the specifics for that yeah. particular area. Did you catch that, Scott? You're muted. So just give me a second. I, uh, I accidentally muted Scott, and so now I have to get him to go through the star six process again. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's always okay. Just a general question. We could have, in the meantime, um, Marnie, Micah asks, from my understanding, the removal of some of the host trees and stumps that the Douglas fir beetle would go for are also trees that would be hosts for many other organisms. Have you found the removal of these host trees and stumps is affecting other organisms? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's a complete ecosystem that you're looking at. I don't think that we've got to the stage with the, the fir beetle that we've removed as much host as we have with pine in the past. And so uh, those kind of long-term impacts that you're talking about, um, I know they're being looked at in the pine forest because the extensive removal of those hosts. And it's something that we should be concerned, you know, looking into in the future with fur, but we just haven't got there in terms of our, of our hectares that uh, are being affected. 
And so um, um, it, it likely is not the same impact that we've seen as in the pine stands in the past. And, you know, the, because of the mosaic of the fir and, and um, the elevation band, you know, we might not be in that same scenario. Good question, though. I mean, it's all part of the ecosystem. They're all tied together. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Scott here. I got figured the unmuting thing out. Sorry. No, it's all good. I did hear the question and uh, just generally wanted to speak to um, the fact that um, some of the, the west side, Christina Lake, um, there was dealing with a root rot as well. So there was kind of a precipitating factor. And then um, as far as specifically targeting, let's say a, a Doug fur beetle, uh, we're doing that in other places across the TSA in different places using um, with the different traps and, and aggregates and all the different pheromone stuff. Uh, we haven't done that specifically over there, but uh, it was tied in with susceptibility based on some uh, increase in beetle, but uh, root rot plus um, that was kind of our overriding factor in that particular place. So, Scott, I guess we might as well proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Marnie, for all that info. It's, I find it really interesting. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, and if there's any follow-up questions, let me know. Thanks. So, Christina, do you think, um, do you want me to pull up the presentation then? Is that how we think it's going to work? Yeah, that's going to work best for me. So, Scott, you had, I got two documents here. Um, yeah, so I was trying to, I was trying to, to grind everyone through that really dry part of the PowerPoint of of, of kind of saying that um, this is this is the kind of the sets out the, the structure and the kind of the guidance with regards to kind of putting the pieces together provincially and, and obviously the direction and and uh, uh, that we're given and that we're following um, the part of it is again is customizing a, a stewardship plan and then uh, ultimately working towards the uh, what I hope some people are familiar with hearing at least is um, the tool of the operating plan on an annual basis, which we try to go through a uh, presentation of, of areas that we're looking at and used to evaluate um, our, op our operations and try to gain through um, that public comment consultation part uh, involving different groups, um, regional district through the areas uh, APCs, uh, societies, and such to to try to drum up as much of the things that need to be evaluated, or at least need to be spoken to, or measured, assessed, whatever it is. So um, that's kind of what I was, like I said, kind of. Do you want me to share the presentation and and you can kind of speak to it, and I'll just change the slides. Yeah, for sure. Just to kind of go through and, and at least somebody can see a word or something that we can either follow up or they can write down and, and search on their own or yeah, just, just kind of, it's a bit of being familiar with the kind of the language, so to speak. Um, and then we'll look at the, uh, another document that I had, we call it the life cycle of the timber cell license or TSL. So if you hear me say TSL, um, I apologize that it stands for um, Timber Sale License. So that's a document we'll look at here at the end, but if you want to just keep burning through the slides there, just keep going. Um, so yeah, just, uh, so basically we'll jump quick from this one to the next one was, there's just the legislative pieces that um, have to do with, this is kind of, this is kind of again, the, the tenure of the timber supply um, these are how these things go or how they're structured. Um, there's lots of difference of opinion and uh, a lot of strong difference of, of opinion on how these things should be done and calculated. However, when they are calculated and put forward, um, that's where the direction comes on 
um, how BCTS operates and uh, what numbers they're using, volume numbers and uh, measurement windows and all that stuff. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, uh, yeah, Range Practices Act. Uh, basically, this is the this is kind of the the framework that uh, we set up the stewardship plan, which accounts for all these different values. Uh, uh, again, uh, legislative sense of putting forward to these are the things that uh, need to be spoken to at minimum. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so. The, the next bunch of slides are just basically speaking to the general, um, kind of like the general areas of of where the considerations are, where the calculations are, and then we'll look at it a little more when we get to the life cycle of the TSL going to different ass uh, assessments and and the things that we go through. But basically, there's there's certain um, we'll call it descriptors of of different levels of this one here is a stand level biodiversity. And it's just looked at for um, different retention. Um, again, by what we have is, is measurements of course, what he um, debris based on biogeochromatic zones on different numbers. And uh, then again, specific to blocks, if we find something that uh, that is, is a value that needs to be measured, I think it gets added in there as well. So uh, next slide, please. So again, it's just another level of, of how things are um, started and the discussions are um, course filter. And then uh, as we work our way down, there's very specific things that um, we're trying to look at. And it's either a straight up evaluation and a kind of a, a percent or a, or a number or a direction comes out of it, or there's a part where you can kind of look at, again, with structural characteristics that mimic uh, potentially um, what we're trying to do with natural disturbance and what those shapes and sizes are and uh, just guidance on how we figure that out and uh, how it kind of all fits together with the previous and historic harvest and trying to go forward. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is just information as far as um, another objective mixed in there with all the different ones and different higher level plans and, and objectives are. There's, there's one there that, that's set by the provincial government legislation for um, both objectives for timber management in in different places that uh, set goals for us to to use to drive our operations. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so again, it's we're looking at these values and uh, we're looking at kind of like the set um, guidance and the legislation that's out there, and also the incorporation of different plans and processes that change or um, methodologies that are changing. Um, also talk about uh, at the bottom there it talks about um, tied into the uh, range evaluation uh, program which basically looks at um, those values and, and gets back to are the strategies and the operational constraints um, working or not working or how can we do things better or start to change to be the basis for change going forward next slide please um, big part is cultural heritage which uh, you know, people interchange with uh, First Nations, but uh, that's a bigger part of it. But it involves some other things as far as cons consultation and the reconciliation part of uh, the First Nations, as well as um, kind of a system of, of archaeological assessment and, uh, you know, a larger course filter overview down to an impact assessment specifically by either finding a site or having a certain rating based on characteristics of the site. And uh, yeah, just that, you know, the, the assessments are done using the qualified professionals in each of those disciplines. And that's what we, we basically use to go forward or create these assessments and, and uh, get the recommendations to try to move forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and again, it's just another value that uh, things are set in certain ways and then we deal with uh, parts of the district staff on giving those objectives and the direction for uh, moving forward. Um, some of this again is uh, certain recreation areas are technically part of the timber harvesting land base uh, and involved in plans that uh, include um, harvesting and uh, some of them are and possibly can be reserved out and uh, are different. There. So OK, 
can mute it uh, automatically there. Hopefully uh, it didn't get cut off. Um, so yeah, next slide. It just keeps on going through um, the values on uh, basically overall on the on the larger area and uh, what we use to uh, to guide operations where um, the measures are established, um, the ungulate winter range is identified, and uh, the percentages based on um, the forest cover are given as far as targets for um, what's operational or what's available or what's unavailable. Next slide, please. Um, again, it's another one where um, visual quality is 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 set out um, in some places in in actually having established quality objectives for specific areas, and then some uh, actually don't, and some of them are non-visible. Um, there's different layers of of quality objectives that are set out, and uh, those are kind of the things that we look to kind of establish in our operating plan referrals are areas that may not fall under to a legislative quality objective, but actually have a local or another feature um, that is important in the resource, which uh, lends itself to having the visual quality um, assessment done. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a big one. I don't want to crack this one open too much uh, because I know that uh, there are certain levels of different kinds of watersheds, uh, different kinds of use. Um, uh, even uh, this presentation is tied into um, with regards to what's important on the watershed level. Um, so there's different, uh, basically it's just saying there are different requirements there, as well as, as kind of um, adding into that is um, kind of a base level. There's cumulative effects we're waiting for. Um, there's a bunch of water talk there with, uh, with everything that's going on, obviously, locally. And just the uh, trying to move forward with doing a, an assessment and looking at the, you know, the calculations that are the foundation for those and then conducting those hydrology assessments on uh, most, if not all, of our uh, operations rather than just limiting it to these types of watersheds, either community or consumptive. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, if you could throw up that other, um, basically this um, kind of this life cycle, we're trying to build this and keep it kind of continuously improved, which means uh, if we have any feedback and anything changes to uh, add it in there. And Suzanne, I don't know if you have that PDF available. Anyways, um, I am just working on it. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, um, I know we've tried this out at uh, some APC meetings um, with regional district and some other groups. And basically, what we're trying to do is 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 show, hopefully, through a, a, an education perspective, that um, is just trying to bring everyone up to the same same level of understanding that when, uh, let's say, either you're looking at a map uh, before harvest or you actually drive down the road and there may be a sign posted with a timber sale license and a bunch of numbers and radio frequencies and just trying to wonder what's going on is that by the time it gets to where um, we're having trees that are that are that are being felled for an access or um, a timber harvesting like a cut block and a timber sale license that um, this is just it's not to overwhelm it's just to um, kind of bring forward and present that there are a lot of steps, um, a lot of um, planned assessments and considerations from the overall, you know, everyone talks about this 100,000 foot level or whatever, is that 100,000 mile level. Is, so it kind of works from the top down. And so this, this here uh, definitely can share it and people can look at it in questions and questions chew it up and spit it out, um, do whatever you want with it as far as the end result is to go, um, can we can we increase the level of you know, at least being familiar education with uh, the timber sales, uh, BC timber sales, timber sale license process and the things that are involved into it. And uh, maybe there's a place where we can have conversations around uh, certain things. And I know a couple of questions that Suzanne had passed along um, basically lean towards, you know, certain landscape level assessments, um, Terrain stability, some things that talked about, um, you know, right down to our obligations on the block with regards to, to slash management and stuff like that. So if you could kind of scroll down if that's possible, just kind of show that 
as we work down and get more specific to the block, um, as we get more specific to this is an area that um, is going to be proposed within the block of a, uh, of a timber sale license, including retention and the harvested area, can the roads and such. Do you, to, do you want me to zoom in or can you see that okay? Uh, personally, I can I can see enough of it okay. It's uh, just yeah, to give looks, the idea yeah. that. Okay. okay. So basically that's all I wanted to do was to say that this is out there and we're trying to use it as a, as best as we can to to try to, to just show that um, all of these things are out there and uh, the consideration through all the different stages and steps, um, use of professionals, contracts and otherwise, that it kind of makes this this, this flow um, just, just more out there so that if there are questions that somebody can take some time and kind of look at this and then maybe what's important or what stage or or you know based on some of the questions i've seen um, to try and go to the place and and just kind of fit things in but understanding um it's kind of like just knowing that you know you want to take a popular verse that everyone seems to bring up but certain times you see the be what was said before and what was said after it's just you see the whole flow and uh kind of the, the structure of maybe where we can have a conversation um, but also know that a lot of stuff goes on um, before and after um, when we are talking about a cut block that's um, related to a timber sale license with BC Timber Sales. So that's kind of my uh, kind of my my wrap up of the basic kind of 101 of some timber sale stuff, and then specifically this is uh, gives some guidance that I hope starts some conversations or um, at least. Um, people can take with them and, and say, hey, I didn't know that before, and uh, it's more information, or uh, again, at least if they have a conversation <clears throat> or a question that uh, we can be a little more specific and maybe focus the conversation a bit better moving forward. So anyway, thanks for your patience, both with me trying to stay on this in the meeting and, and going through some of that dry stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Now, hey, does welcome. anybody have any questions? I don't see any in the Q&A box, but. So we've got two hands raised. Um, oh, Scott's raised his hand. <laughs> so I'm gonna allow, oh, Raymond. Raymond, I've, I've asked you to unmute as long as. Yeah, I did that. Perfect. Did you have a question? Well, it's a question and uh, maybe a comment uh, uh, there as well. Uh, I have a couple of questions actually for Scott. Um, so it's quite a process you describe there. Um, um, you have to go through uh, um, in order to uh, finally start logging. Uh, so all your, your timber sales license process. Um, I understand that in BC or as in Canada, by far the vast majority of um, uh, logging uh, operations um, are done through clear cutting. And um, clear cutting um, is, of course, um, has been well established, I think, in the last decades. Um, a pretty bad uh, um, way of um, of keeping a sustainable um, forestry um, business. Um, so uh, the uh, University of BC um, uh, published a lot of presentations uh, about that. Um, coming to my question uh, um, there. So one is the sustainability. And so I, I, my assumption is um, you've got to go through all these factors Appears to be that they're a little bit skewed um, there, and we end up with clear cutting. The next thing, uh, what I learned recently, was that um, the impact on the GDP in British Columbia of the logging industry is less is about twenty percent of the impact of the tourism industry. Tourism is almost five times as big as logging. Now. With the clear cutting, uh, um, and, and uh, although the government, BC, and the uh, companies involved uh, like to hide, of course, as much uh, as they can, this uh, these clear cut fields, 
But the clear cutting, of course, impacts tourism. People just don't want to come into clear cut areas. So I was, um, I found it very interesting. I did not know this when you said that a recreation officer needs to authorize um, uh, the activities um, there. So my questions are, um, where does this recreation officer reside for the boundary? Who, who would that be? And the other one is, how much are you coordinating, uh, let's say, with the ground corporation destination BC, uh, the impact of um, the clear cutting practice um, uh, with uh, on, on tourism? Of course, we probably can spend the next three days debating this. So, but I, just these two simple questions: Who is the recreation officer, and how much are you um, dealing with destination BC? Okay, thanks, Raymond, for your questions. Um, like you said, I think there's quite a uh, quite a conversation um, in just the stuff that you've brought forward, specifically. The recreation officer um, is in, basically works with the Selkirk, out of the Selkirk Forest District. And uh, so kind of split, I think it's uh, between Castlegar and Nelson, um, as far as where that goes these days, I'm not sure. Um, so those are the, that's the contact uh, that we deal with as far as um, with respect to recreation areas under uh, certain sections of the legislation that we we look to uh, and forward our um, our plans and proposals to the recreation officer there. Um, as far as the answer to the destination BC tourism uh, collaboration thing is, uh, at this time we don't. Definitely a an interesting uh, an interesting concept, but the answer is. Uh, at this time, we don't receive any feedback from them as far as uh, referrals of our plans yet. Well, thank you very much. Um, that um, answered my questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Rain. Thanks, Scott. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk quickly about um, clear cutting because I or maybe the different types of blocks because I think that um, I think that that would be nice for us to understand. I know that not everything is clear cut. Um, but if you could just talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Well, with respect to um, with respect to BC timber sales, um, and which might have obviously had similarities with um, different tenure holders and, and across the land base. Um, based on that, um, yeah, the, I guess the, the, the variations of clear cutting, and that's kind of the part that there's kind of a big variation of clear cutting, which has different types of retention and different levels of retention in them. Uh, some of them, if not uh, a majority have uh, groups of retained areas and a variation of, of nothing left behind as far as uh, advanced regeneration, for instance, that the uh, with timber sales, the, the net area to be reforested is, is basically done through artificial, uh, meaning we plant uh, the variety, variety of species based on the biogeo. Um, other ones, depending on the stand structure, we, uh, we have different objectives for uh, leaving that level of retention um, based on whether it's advanced regeneration or the structure is uh, whatever different layer that they're from, um, depending on if they're there. Um, the other part is it's still called a clear cut. So um, until we go into a, a different soil culture system with selection or um, some sort of a overstory, a different kind of a system, um, a lot of that retention, even though it's out there, still gets called clear cut. And so it's kind of all put together. Um, I know that based on, yeah, just feedback, uh, there's a lot of, of from public to land base, um, a lot of different factors coming down that we're looking at, um, trying to expand that to um, 
smaller timber sale licenses, um, harvesting in uh, whether it be a wildfire interface to ungulate winter range, um, visuals, um, some other places that uh, would require different levels of retention. Um, and doing that there, um, still with those, we still would end up calling it a clear cut, um, although we could have a, a 20, 25, 30, 35% retention in those blocks. So um, sometimes it's more about what the actual retention is rather than what it's called. Um, so, but we have, yeah, we still, we have obvious clear cuts where uh, we have areas of no retention where it's going to be a full artificial regeneration. Oh, oh. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else have any questions or comments? No? Well, Scott, um, do you want to speak? Then we'll just get right into the BC Timber Sales updates if you had a bit more to say about that. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> basically, what I wanted to say in general was um, we definitely have, um, and I'm just making some assumptions here that uh, people are, the people that are attending today are. Um, I would say more than well informed on certain aspects of forestry, um, as we've heard, um, especially in the boundary area. And uh, we have quite a few challenges coming forward to try to balance um, the BC timber sales. Part of that is, um, again, driven by uh, and held accountable to certain provincial legislative goals and, and direction. Uh, what happens for us is uh, I've mentioned the operating plan. And so it's been a little bit wrinkly in the past, and I thought we uh, we, were, we were making some headway. Um, I still think that there's some some uh, some time and energy investment into clarity on what exactly an operating plan is, what it does, and what its kind of purpose and intention. Um, <clears throat> so the operating plan comes out. Uh, we're working on another one, so that's an annual thing, but it doesn't represent. Uh, areas for annual harvest. It represents uh, areas as we find them, areas as we search into uh, reconnaissance um, that we want to look at to find out what's important on the land base, the uh, specific resources and values that are out there. So that operating plan, I just want to say that the operating plan is, uh, is, is being worked on and uh, is going to be sent out for uh, referral and given to uh, various stakeholders, groups, uh, starting with the First Nations um, as well, coming up um, maybe before Christmas, but in around December, January, uh, maybe a little bit more towards January this year. We've had a lot of staff turnover in the field team, and uh, so we're working on uh, getting people plugged in with the different groups and contacting people and then working with through the APC um, with regional district and trying to disseminate information as much as possible. So we basically have that, that's kind of our, our, our biggest part of trying to start our consultation across all the groups to try to get those conversations going and try to have those meetings and try to go through the process to, uh, together as we kind of obviously uh, our objective to drill down and to uh, harvest volume. Thank you. And does anybody have any questions or comments on that? Not that you can see. <laughs> I can't see when anybody puts their hands up. So I got to rely on you for that one. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm watching for the hands. Okay. We've got no hands up at the moment. Well, I guess we'll go, um, we'll speak with Evan now uh, with Interfor. So are we uh, seeing my screen there? Yes, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. So, so Oh, I was uh, going to say if, um can you introduce yourself or we can do that for you, but so everybody knows who you are. Sure. Uh, I'm Evan. I've uh 
I'm a planning forester with Interfor in Grand Forks, and I've been here for just over three years. And I was going to start by saying I, I, this is my fourth time presenting here, and it's the fourth time that I've shown the group this CP406 up Sutherland. So um, it's going to be old news for those who, who remember my last uh, presentations. Um, so I, I'm going to give a, a pretty brief kind of operational plan and, and summary of what, what's been going on up here. And I'm going to try to give lots of time uh, for questions and for Doug to talk about the rail grade um, since there's lots going on over there. So for anybody who doesn't know, um, this is our CP406 and it's up the Sutherland FSR. Um, and this August, at the beginning of August, we had uh, Tabalti logging move in here to start operations. And they started at these three green blocks at the top. Um, so they completed activities and pulled out in early October. So for these three blocks, the harvesting is completed, uh, the volumes hauled, the permanent roads are deactivated and the temporary roads are rehabilitated. Um, so other than some slash pile burning and, and then planting um, in a couple of years, these are all complete. And this is at about 11 kilometers off the Sutherland FSR. Um, in about a month ago, in early November, uh, RNA started moving, uh, or sorry, late November, a few weeks ago, RNA moved in their equipment. Um, they have a steep slope tethered unit. So they're gonna be using that on block three and block five in red here. Uh, so we've got uh, an active hauling sign at half a kilometer on Fife. And then we have our hauling signs by the old uh, fire hall as well. Uh, right now, block one in yellow here, they've completed the, the harvesting. So the, the trees are all felled, but we're hauling right now. So we're right now we're hauling uh, at a pretty limited capacity at about three loads a day. And as we start uh, getting more underway, we'll be probably closer to, to 10 loads a day on average. Um, this week, they've moved into block two, this other yellow block here. And so they're active in there right now. And then after that, we'll be into three and five. Uh, our plan is to uh, take advantage of the frozen ground and uh, finish logging and hauling uh, before the freshet comes and road restrictions come on. Um, other than that, uh, I know right now there's potential activity going on in the woodlot, which is on the south side of Sutherland Creek over here. Um, they haven't, uh, as far as I know, they, they haven't have, they don't have any official plans going on, but I know they're, they're interested in uh, getting moving on that while log prices are good. Um, so if anybody has any specific questions on this, um, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I'll, I'll move on to Doug and, and try to leave lots of time for more general questions. So I don't see any hands up. Uh, Evan, thank you. That I haven't seen all of your presentations in the past, so that was really interesting for me. Um, and I was just gonna say for the person on the phone, if they want to make a call in, or sorry, an email through, we certainly can try to unmute you as well. And I think we've got one in Q and A. Yeah. So Raymond is wondering if you can show highway three on that map, please. Uh, the extent of this map it is what it is here. Um, this is at about five kilometer, this first block on the Sutherland FSR. So that hooks up with the Fife road, which comes down to Highway 3 at, uh, at Cool Treat there, which is my reference point.
Okay. Okay, Doug. I guess. Do you, is that the map there, Evan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, this uh, particular cutting permit is called 459, uh, and it started. At, you know, as you saw from Scott's presentation, there's a quite a lengthy lengthy process involved in 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 getting to the point where you actually cut your first tree. So this one started probably five years ago. Uh, probably, you know, one of the key concerns here was the rail grade because it was uh, part of the uh, Trans Canada Trails network. So uh, we went through quite a bit of a process to be able to operate on, on the grade itself. And one of the reasons why we felt that it was necessary to use the grade was that the alternatives were just not acceptable, really. They, they just weren't tenable. They're, you know, they, the wood on the south side of the grade is all part of the forest tenure. Uh, but in order to get that without using the grade, we would have had to cross Chris, uh, McRae Creek uh, perhaps three times with, with bridges uh, and we would have still had to cross the rail grade. Other options might have included building a, a, a road parallel to the grade, which we didn't feel was in anyone's best interests. And then a possible third option might have been to helicopter it out, which is usually impractical from an economic sense. Uh, so anyway, uh, Evan, if so, we've just started on the the road building in this permit. Yes. Uh, so the the first part that we've done. So this first part that links up Highway Three to the rail grade, we call it the Lafferty Link. And as you probably noticed, if you've driven by there, uh, it's uh, it's nearly complete, that section. If you heard a big boom there last week, that was some blasting that we did. Uh, there's one and three quarter kilometers, kilometers of road in this Lafferty Link Road, and then that's the new road. And then we're going to use approximately 12 kilometers of the rail grade. This year, we'll be only on perhaps seven kilometers of it. Uh, and we've started building road on the Maz Road, which is a new road. Uh, Evan, if you can move up a little bit. We originally, uh, I call this the Mazaki Road uh, uh, after Olivia Mazaki, who used to own the store in the uh, post office at Fife, and I think who is Lorraine Barg's grandfather. But anyway, I guess it was too long for the sign, so that shortened the Maz. Uh, that's where that that name came from. Uh, we're we're currently uh, let's see. Did you go to the beginning? Yeah, there's a, roughly 15 kilometers of road on this road system, and we're currently about 500 meters uh, up the first leg of it. This permit has got about roughly 40,000 cubic meters, I believe. Evan, is that correct? Oh, he's probably yeah. on mute. Yeah, uh, about uh, 45, yeah. Okay, and that's, that's roughly a thousand truckloads of logs, uh, which is, um, it's about probably almost 10% of Interfor's tenured cut in one year. So this will probably be cut over the next couple of years, I would assume. So there, there's three, three, uh, points of like additional interest uh, on the rail grade itself, which is uh, often what a lot of people are interested about. There's a railway bridge that uh, we're going to use. We're going to uh, change the decking on it a little bit to make it suitable for logging trucks. And we're going to widen the uh, railings that are on the side. We're going to push them out. 
but otherwise we're going to leave that that bridge is a really good strong bridge and we're going to use it without altering it too much uh, there's the bicycle bridge that you probably most of you know about uh, this one was put in as a result of a washout uh, several uh, i'm not sure now 15 years ago perhaps now uh, that went down into mccray creek I was just up there, actually I was up there today, and I just kind of had an estimate in my mind. I, I think there must have been 15,000 cubic meters of material that sluiced down into McCray Creek, and you all know the results of that. I, I, I actually flew over the lake after that washout happened, and it had uh, plumed out into the lake for quite a distance. It was quite a mess and it's interfered with the spawning uh, kokanee ever since, I think. But anyway, we have, uh, uh, the situation that caused this was a flume that uh, CPR had, and they, they did this in a number of cases. They had these flumes that would take the water in a gully and they would take it along the edge of the gully so that it, it could go through a culvert that they didn't have to dig way down deep into the bottom of the, uh, of the gully. Uh, but over the last number of years, there's been about three of these washouts that are they're almost identical to the McCray slide. Uh, one of them was, uh, I think it was a, this side of Carmine. Uh, it, it went down, wiped out, went right down onto the highway there. Uh, there's one, uh, the other side of Paulson that went down into the Arrow Lakes. Uh, but they're all really similar. Uh, it's where the flume gave way after 30 years of inattention or a tree fell across one of them and took it out. And then the water would go down, fill up the hole. And if there was a pipe in the bottom, it was inadequate. And so the water would build up and there'd be a little lake there. And then all of a sudden it would give way. So we've had about three of those now that have been fairly major disasters. There's one more on this section of the 12 kilometers that we're gonna be using. Um, and I have a picture of it, but uh, anyway, I won't get in, I won't, I won't go into it. You, you kind of understand. I think if you've been on the grade, you'll, you'll have probably seen situations like this where you see a, a flume that starts up the gully, run, runs along the contour, and then takes the water through a culvert that's only buried maybe a, a meter or two deep uh, on the grade itself. Uh, we have one of these situations that's uh, just identical to these other uh, ones that, that have washed out and caused the disaster. So we're gonna try and uh, take this out and fix it this year. Uh, I'm hoping to do that the last thing we do before we leave in the spring or before late winter, I should say, because we are intending to start packing up close to the middle of February and be out of there by the end of February. But one of the last things I wanna do is go in there and, and uh, put a culvert in and uh, back up this flume just in case it fails. And I think I'll leave it at that. And if there are questions, I'll leave it open for questions. Thank you. I see there's uh, one for me in the uh, Q&A there. Um, so the question is what size these two larger blocks are and if they're clear cut. Uh, so the this sort of green hatched symbol are our wildlife tree retention areas associated with the block. Um, so those are um, permanent reserves. So they're they're both clear cut with reserves. And block three uh, is 20 hectares, and block five is 42 hectares. And the uh, this 406 permit was targeting uh, pine stands. So there, that's a big driver in in them being. Um, clear cuts uh, for being within the watershed and uh, to try to reduce kind of the, the hazard of, of a large scale um, 
mountain pine beetle outbreak. And there, there was uh, Gary Shaw asked, had the VQA, the visual quality assessment, um, play and block layout. Uh, for this permit, it was, it didn't, it's not part of the VQA. So I'm assuming that uh, he's asking about the rail grade. Um, I don't know, did you wanna to speak to that, Doug, or did you want me to? Sure, uh, yeah, it's played a significant part in this one because it's in some of the highest rated visual uh, rest restricted areas, or how would you say that, visual uh, visual quality objectives or some of the- It's our, our highest constrained level of visual quality, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of these block shapes are either more broken up in oblong or they're smaller than they uh, technically could be and uh, for visual considerations. And also um, particularly the ones over here and the ones over here have more extensive uh, retention and are, uh, have, are fully partial cut or have partial cut uh, sections. Uh, in consideration for visuals. I've got a question here from Marlene. So I just requested you to unmute. Okay, Thank is that you. unmuted? Perfect, sounds good. All right, so um, I'm kind of new to that topic that Doug um, just presented, but uh, how long would the road that's being put, uh, currently put in, which is kind of across from McCray Creek and McCray Road, how long would they trucks be hauling timber from there? Um, and what times of year? We, we, we in, in this particular permit, because it does uh, rely on the rail grade to access timber, we have committed to not logging in the summertime. So between the long weekend in September uh, to the long weekend in May is a, a kind of opportunity that we have there that we said that we would stick to. Uh, we will probably be even more restrictive than that because of course it's difficult. We, we wouldn't want to be hauling in May usually or, or April because it's you know your, your breakup time so or even March. So uh, we would probably be hauling there uh, October to end of February, perhaps into March a little bit, depending on the weather. But this year, this year, there may only be 60 or 80 loads, logging truck loads, because and it's just. How long is the road building portion um, with the heavy equipment going in? Uh, pardon, could you repeat that, please? <clears throat> For the road building and the bridging and the things you just discussed there, how long? Um, a period is that like is it go into a two to five year horizon or what timeline yeah uh, the cutting permit is four years although cutting permits may be extended uh, uh, but in this case the cutting permit is four years and i you know it, maybe i'll let you answer that evan yeah so the this cutting permit expires in September of 2023. Um, like Doug said, there are opportunities to um, put them on hold where you can um, kind of stop the time click, uh, ticking off on it if you're not active in there. But our, our goal is definitely to be done um, by that time. So we have you know, as short a window as possible where we're, we're using this kind of high, high use or shared value area. Uh, the goal is to finish road building next year within our operating window, and then uh, and then we get one more year after that, another operating window to get all the wood out as well. Is that feasible? Like, because you mentioned like a thousand 
truckloads. So that's a lot of truckloads in uh, whatever months, October to February. Yeah, it, it's a. It, there's definitely a lot of operational hurdles, but it, it is feasible. Um, there's a short cycle time from uh, the blocks to the mill, so that that uh, is a, is a pretty big uh, factor in, in being able to get that done. So, how many trucks per day would you see happening? Oof, uh, wildly uh, variable. <laughs> yeah. To give a non-answer, but yeah, it, you know, it's uh, there's so many factors. It, it'd be it'd be really hard to to give oh, you a straight answer on that one. Yeah, it just seemed like a lot of trucks coming out onto a highway uh, in winter um, driving conditions <laughs> per day. From if you, if a thousand uh, truck loads is um, even for the one portion, yeah. If, if there was one contractor in there, it would tend to be perhaps 12 to 15 loads a day, maybe 20. Um, but, it, but it does depend. If there were two contractors in there, it could be more. One thing that we have going good for us here is that where the, where the Lafferty Road hits the highway, there's long straight stretches there, which makes with, with lots of uh, line of sight and that kind of thing. So, so it, it's uh, pretty good for trucks turning onto the highway. You can see see the traffic coming for a long ways away. Yeah, and anytime that we build a road that junctions uh, an MOTI road, um, we we're required to get a permit from them, and they go out and do a sightline assessment. Um, so we obviously mm -hmm. have the permit, but it, it's a particularly friendly um, spot to come out onto a highway. Yeah. Yeah, the, well, the larger trucks have to slow down for the oncoming big hill, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So, I think that, did Raymond still have his hand up? Christina? Uh, yes, so there we go. I've just asked Raymond to, to unmute, perfect. Thank you, um, uh, Marlene asked, uh, asked a lot of questions I wanted to ask since I'm a resident here of McRae Road, as uh, Doug knows. And thanks for the warning. It was quite a bang when you were blasting. And I think uh, definitely um, I personally do appreciate getting an access road to the Trans-Canada Trail for cycling. So that's nice. But these logging trucks are really a concern, uh, knowing how these truck drivers drive. So um, here's a question for um, Interform and uh, how you're controlling your subcontractors who are driving these trucks. What's the chance that you can force these truckers into defensive driving? I mean, it's done um, in the oil business, you know, in the oil page, big companies, they force their subcontractors to um, uh, keep four seconds uh, distance, um, not going bumper to bumper, slow down. And I hear that you, you think it's, um, it's a really good um, junction there. Um, I thought they would turn left into the Highway 3 uh, at that point. So it's, it is quite an exercise there. But anyway, my key question is, how do you enforce defensive driving practices of your logging truck drivers? One thing that's uh, comprehensive across the company is that vehicles have, uh, they've got uh, videos, dash cam, cam, dash cams, yeah, on, on for, so that if ever there's an incident, uh, it, it gets immediately reviewed and we can see who's actually at fault and, and, and what happened. We have a very professional driving um, staff or contractors and and it's a it's a huge priority for us to maintain safety um you know that said things do happen uh now and again and like doug said um it's a company-wide program that everybody has dash cams so if you ever have have an incident or you see something um you can reach out to myself or doug or, or whoever you're you can get a hold of at interfor 
And if you give us a time and place, we can find that driver and we can review their dash cam and, and talk to them specifically. But um, in general, it's a, it's a high priority for us, uh, safety and, and driver safety as well. And, and it's heavily incentivized for the drivers to maintain a good safety record and the contractors to have a safety program. And, and we have quite a, an extensive enforcement program as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I see what I see every day, and I'm sure most of these drivers are not uh, subcontractors to Interfor, um, but um, uh, obeying speed limits and safe distances, um, I think that is unknown to most of these logging truckers uh, I experience on a daily basis. That's why these thousand trucks with uh, 12, 20, maybe even more loads. Um, a day is a real safety concern uh, for uh, for me and probably for some other people too. Right. Yeah. So you know, we we might even you might even see the exact same truck, and one day he's hauling for us, and another day he's not. Um, uh, so, like I said, if you do see something, reach out to us, and, and we do have the means and and the uh, the drive to to make sure it gets addressed. Thank you. I see that we have one more um, question here from Wendy Phelan. Does this permit include logging in the rail grade area from the Paulson bypass towards Arrow Lakes, Castlegar? A month ago, I encountered signs posted of the rail grade road being closed at the bypass parking lot. Uh, it, it doesn't include anything past Coriel Creek. Uh, this particular permit. So if you go right to the north end, that's just south of Coriel. Uh, I did put a sign up at the Paulson bypass that says that the, the rail grade will be restricted to public traffic this winter from uh, 64 to 76 kilometer. Uh, now, some of the signs, a lot of the mileage signs aren't up, but if you, Lafferty is to give you a, a reference, Lafferty is at 72, and Fife is about 82, even though on the signs it says 73 and 83. But anyway, that's a reference as to the area that we're operating in. Thank you. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I think so. Okay. Yeah. And I've got Marlene uh, has got her hand up, so I'll just I just ask you to unmute. Okay. It's more a comment um, to supplement Raymond's um, uh, questions and comment. Um, I'm also uh, on the McRae Road and. Um, it's not just the drivers of your trucks for that left-hand turn. Um, it's the drivers on the highway. And we hear way too many of them having to, having to wait, they're waiting way too late to slow down for the um, hill at the Christina Lake viewpoint. So we know they're going fast. And if you try, when you're wanting to turn out off of McRae onto, um, uh, highway three for us a right hand turn um, we know the conditions and how fast some of those larger trucks are going and their inability to stop fast so I don't know if yeah it's just a comment I guess that signage um, way ahead for getting those bigger trucks especially and in the summer everybody with an RV because they're heading down although you won't be hauling then so that may not be an issue um, but just, uh, yeah, signage way in advance to the north of your left-hand turn onto... Um, yeah, the, the highways department's department has uh, set requirements for those warning signs. Uh, the ones that are up there right now, and uh, like the truck turning signs with a picture of a logging truck on it, they are required to be 270 meters from the where, where the turnout is 
and it's just something that's in their manual. So that's what I went with. Um, they base that on breaking times and things like that, I guess, some kind of science that they have. <laughs> Sometimes they're not noticed or... <laughs> There, there are issues when they're put up and never taken down and then it kind of becomes visual white noise. Um, yeah. 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 That's, that's something that you can, the Ministry of Transportation, if you want to contact them and, and speak to them about putting more signage up, I mean, you can always feel free to contact them. Um, these, the people that we have here today won't be the ones that can make decisions on that. Yeah. Is there any other questions? I think um, there's one more here. Have you taken out the cut blocks that are on the rail trail? And that's from Seal Sander. Evan, that's your question. Uh, th there's some that were didn't uh, end up part of the permit. Uh, there's some that are adjacent to the trail. So this pink line is the rail grade. So this block close to where that new road connecting the highway to the trail is adjacent to the trail. There's the lower section of this block just past our new Maz road here. And then there's these two small ones in the low side of the trail. Um, there is a, a slight buffer between the trail and the blocks, but they're they're essentially adjacent. I, I will just I will just add one thing. We are brushing the 12 kilometers that we have under road permit. Uh, we will be brushing and clearing that so that we can plow snow and so that we can haul trucks uh, so that we can haul uh, uh, logs down it safely. We, we need to have lines of sight and enough width to plow uh, snow plus uh, allow the trucks to pass. So uh, that's, that's what we're going to be doing this winter. Do you have a plan for when the brushing is going to start? Uh, it's kind of now. There's one more question here. Are there other companies working in the bypass to Arrow Lake section of the rail grade as there was heavy equipment altering the rail grade route at about 10 to 15 K towards the Arrow Lakes? Does anybody know that? Uh, yes, there's uh, actually Scott maybe could say because there's Timber sales is over there. I think Interforce is over there. There's there's actually quite a bit of activity on the other side of Paulson, but maybe Scott could add something to that. Uh, yeah, I could, well, like nothing specific, uh, just with the other field team over there, it's kind of the, the, the transition between the two is, is a little fuzzy on this end for us to know specifically, but uh, we could have a number if someone wants to get in touch uh, we could direct them to uh, you know, ask some more questions. Okay, so we could provide that if, um, oh, was it Wendy that asked that? If you want the, the number to contact them, we can provide that. And I, I think that's all for questions, folks, unless there's anything else that comes up. Um, I just want to say thank you to our presenters for giving us all this information. It's um, really nice for us to be able to speak to you all and hear from you and kind of interact and ask questions because we don't always get to talk to you every day. Um, so thanks for taking the time to do that. And as well, thank you for the people who attended um, and registered for this. Uh, well, hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. Um, and. And we're going to be holding another one in January, towards the end of January, that's going to be focused on shoreline health and riparian areas around Christina Lake, including some regulatory uh, regulatory items and possibly discussion about weeds. Um, so 
stay tuned for that. <laughs> now, if anybody, unless anybody has anything else to add, we could probably say goodbye and and uh, go from there. Thank you. Great range of talks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, yeah, thanks very much, Suzanne, for this. You betcha. Take care, you guys.